I will sit down. Um, the, the, the title of the talk will be On the Border of Order from a Zuma Organization in Space and Time. in space and time uh, in, inside the nucleus. So let me outline the problem. Uh, in human cells, two meters of DNA are packaged inside a container, the nucleus, that is only a few microns in diameter. And so the natural question is, uh, how is this degree of compaction achieved? We know that at the most basic level, uh, chromosomal DNA is pulled around um, uh, to form what is called a 11 nanometer th th thick fiber. However, how this fiber is packaged further to achieve several more orders of magnitude of compaction uh, is uh, largely a mystery. Uh, furthermore, the chromosomes are not static occupants of the nucleus, they constantly wiggle around. Um, and so, uh, not only do they have you know, this spatial pattern of uh, chromosomal fold, chromatin folding, but whatever the pattern is, it changes with time. Uh, the spatial temporal organization of the genome is not only an interesting uh, physics problem, it's also an important biological problem. The, the easiest way to see this is, that, um, is to realize that uh, two segments of DNA that may be separated by vast genomic distances, millions of base pairs along the DNA, DNA uh, in a folded chromosome uh, may end up uh, interacting neighbors. And so imagine that one of the segments is uh, activates the expression of the other, and, and so they, this may result, uh, may, may have dramatic consequences for the fate of the cell and the entire organism. Uh, several years ago, my uh, biology collaborators at UC San Diego made a remarkable breakthrough um, where they were able to visualize the motion of genomic segments in real time inside the nuclei of mammalian cells. So what we're looking at um, are the nuclei of B cells from mice. Um, the two dots in each nucleus mark the location of so-called DJ segments on two sister chromosomes. Um, so um, a little bit of background uh, information on B and DJ segments. You know that our adaptive immune system uh, is quite remarkable. We can generate many more different types of, um, we can generate ma many different types of antibodies, right? But uh, the antibodies are proteins and we don't have millions of different genes. And so the question is how is it possible to generate uh, many more different types of antibodies than, than their genes in our genome? And the answer, at least at the most basic level, the answer to this is um, the genetic mechanism of antibody production known as BDJ recombination. So this is a very schematic representation uh, of the idea. Um, here's the immunoglobal in heavy chain locus, the region of DNA, about 3 million base pairs long, that is responsible for the production of antibodies. These, uh, the, the locus consists of multiple copies, hundreds or so copies of so-called B segments, variable, multiple copies of D segments, and multiple copies of J segments. D and J stands for diversity and joining. And so in the first step of VDJ recombination, one of the D segments recombined with one of the J to form a DJ joint. And then in the second step, one of these hundreds of B segments recombined with, with DJ to form BDJ. So the genes that, that, that uh, are responsible for the production of antibodies, these genes themselves are assembled from gene segments in this kind of combinatorial process. And um, uh, this combinatorial nature of this process results in a great diversity of the resulting antibodies. And so what we are looking here at are the uh, fluorescently marked uh, DJ segments on two uh, chromosomes. Uh, my biology collaborators uh, developed a genetically modified mouse that carried the fluorescent markers and placed next to DJ segments. 
And um, oh God, sorry, I'm I'm just curious. Is this monoallelic or does it happen on both alleles? This is this is monoallelic. Really? But maybe we know just can correct. Yes. So the other chromosome is not related. So there is a mechanism of um, allelic exclusion. Exclusion. I think So, as you can see, this experiment was a single color experiment, right? And so uh, we were able to visualize the relative motion of genomic segments of, of two different chromosomes, but of course what would be really interesting is to visualize the relative motion of V and DJ in the same chromosome, and that would require a second color. And so we had to rely on, on uh, theory, uh, polymer physics, uh, modeling to make a prediction about how V and might be moving maybe moving relative to DJ based on the intrachromosomal motion that it was observed. <clears throat> and now I'm delighted to report that um, a few years ago, my biology collaborators uh, realized that a fancy version of this experiment, where they inserted a second color um, in, next to one of the V segments, mm -hmm. and so this um, enabled the direct visualization of VDJ motion in the same chromosome. And this, of course, allowed us to test the predictions we've made uh, using theory and to gain more uh, detailed insights in the long-range genomic interactions. So uh, with data like this, uh, we uh, were hoping to address a number of what we think are fundamental questions. Uh, questions such as, what's the mechanism of genomic motion? And by mechanism, I mean uh, a physical principle that is expressed in terms of an equation, right? so that we can talk about uh, these quantitatively. Um, another question we were interested in, what, what's the um, environment of the cell nucleus feels like, uh, the environments through which the genomic segments have to travel in order to find each other? And then there is an associated question, uh, what are the encounter times, or the mean first passage times for the genomic encounters? Um, another question we were interested in, how should we think about the chromosomal DNA? What phase matters? That? Should we think of it as a solid, or a liquid, or, or something in between? So uh, something that was uh, evident just from just by watching these movies was that there were roughly two um, categories of cells that cells are nominal identical. In one uh, group of cells, V and DJ, red and green dot, uh, were initially uh, spatially uh, separated by relatively large spatial distances, say 600 uh, nanometers or more. And what's interesting, they uh, the way they moved is they explored their immediate neighborhood, but they remained separated throughout the entire imaging time, about an hour. While in another group of cells, V and DJ, remember they are all separated by the same identical genomic uh, distance, about 2 million base pairs. They were initially spatially close, and they remained close throughout, throughout the entire imaging time. So we can make this observation more quantitative, uh, by plotting the spatial distance uh, in individual VDJ pairs as a function of time from which individual nucleus, and this is the plot. And when we color code the distance trajectories um, according to the average value, red and large value, blue is small, a small value, we find um, that the trajectories revealed is this rainbow pattern with a demixing effect. Uh, in other words, they, within uh, individual VDJ pairs, uh, the, the way that the segments move is that they fluctuate around um, an average value that remains essentially constant throughout the entire imaging time. So to understand uh, the, the <coughs> mechanism of genomic motion, uh, we uh, analyzed a number of quantities that are well known mm -hmm. as uh, diagnostic tools uh, for um, trying to understand the, the underlying mechanism of diffusive motion. The first of, of these tools is the mean square displacement. Uh, as you know, the mean square displacement is the measure of excursion of the random walker from the point of origin during time tower. And so uh, the green curve is the mean square displacement for the um, interchromosomal motion, relative motion of uh, two green dots on different chromosomes. The red curve is the mean square displacement of the intrachromosomal motion, the relative motion of V and DJ, red and green, in the same chromosome. Uh, on the log log plot, the slope of the mean square displacement yields the scale and exponent alpha. Um, as we know, the scale and exponent alpha equal to one corresponds to normal diffusion. 
we see that uh, for both interchromosomal and intrachromosomal motion, alpha is not way less than one. That is, the motion is subdiffusive. And quite remarkably, for the intrachromosomal motion, P and J moving relative to each other, the scaling exponent uh, on average is about 0.25. So the motion is strongly subdiffusive. To get the idea about what might be causing this subdiffusive motion, uh, what the nature of the environment through which the genomic elements move, uh, we looked at um, another quantity, which is helpful, that also helpful that diagnostic tool, the velocity autocorrelation function. So what velocity autocorrelation function does, it takes the average velocity <coughs> of genomic segment at time t and compares it with the velocity of the same segments time tau later. Do these velocities know about each other? So we find, and of course, in order to calculate the velocity of the correlation, uh, you have to calculate the velocity itself. It's not measured. Um, so you calculate the velocity using the standard definition, because you know the position, standard definition of the average velocity, because you know the position and function of time. And uh, delta is the discretization interval, which you use to calculate the velocity, the average velocity, while tau is the time lag over which you're examining the correlation. Right? And so we find that for all values of the discretization, interval of delta, the velocity of the correlation functions dive into the negative values, so they did negative correlations. And this is an indication um, of a pushback from the environment. So the genomic segments make a step in one direction, the next step is likely to be in the opposite direction. Uh, what's also interesting is that the value uh, of the velocity of the correlation at the dip uh, is very close to negative 0.5. Negative 0.5 is the theoretical limit of extreme confinement. And so this suggests that uh, the uh, strongly subdiffusive mm -hmm. motion is caused by um, a very strongly confining uh, environment. An environment that is springy, um, exerts pushback, right? But it's also um, uh, imposing uh, strong spatial constraints on the, section, the motion of the segment. Mm -hmm. Um, the velocity correlation function exhibits a number of other interesting properties. Uh, for example, um, if we report the velocity of the correlation against the scale time lag, tau over delta, they all collapse on a, on a master curve, which is an indication of cell similarity, similar patterns in, in space and time. Yeah. Is the velocity of 2D factor you are referring here? So this is the radial component of the velocity. So I should probably go back and mention that uh, we also analyzed the radial components of mean square displacement. So that's one out of three degrees of freedom. And the reason we did this is because, as you probably saw in the movies, the cells the nu and the nuclei exhibit a lot of rotational and transformational motion. And you know, as a theorist, I made the main suggestion to my experimental colleagues to maybe mobilize the cells somehow. And I, I'm not going to make a suggestion like this in the future, because the cells apparently must remain happy. Right? So they want to rotate, then they wish to allow them to do so. And so we have to find a way to decouple rotational and translational motion from the interesting motion. right? And so that's why we're looking at the radial component. But can I ask, if you make those boring measurements, Boring measurements, yes. If you, the boring ones, yes. what, what kind of correlation times do you get? Yeah. Right, because you're going to get some kind of a, if you measure the, the velocity correlation, order correlation function for the center of mass or something, then you will get, there will be some kind of a correlation time. You know, is that right? You get some kind of a delta function that's got, a, that's got some kind of a filter on it. What, what do you what, what do you the correlation time scale for what exactly? Just say the center of mass of the two. You're looking at the distance between the two. Yes, because but that's what. Yes. That's interesting. Yes, yes. But what's boring is just looking at the center of mass and how much how it's moving around. But how does that move? Because that it's not completely without interest. That, Certainly, yes. Yeah. Well, maybe we can actually try to see it from the movies. Yeah. Okay. But. Um, We'll talk about that later. Yes. So, uh, delta is the time interval you calculate the velocity. Delta. I'm sorry? Delta is the time interval you use to calculate the velocity. Yeah, so you use your sample. Yes. So values for, of delta. So why does the minimum exactly that's in delta? Ah, excellent question. Yes. Yes. Why they no, this is not an artifact. Why the minimum occurs at uh, the value of delta? Yes, that's an excellent question. So we have tau, right, the interval over which we are examining the correlation. And we have delta, which is the interval over which we are calculating the velocity. So large tau, right, the zero tau, this is tau equal to delta. 
So we are looking at two sequential steps. And so the deep that occurs at delta means that a step in one direction will likely be followed by the step in the opposite direction. So that's what uh, is manifested by the deep being at the delta. So this is some experiments, is that right? These experimental data, yeah, so far. These experimental data. Yeah. Shouldn't that stop being true if you go to a sufficiently large delta? Because sometimes you get to a mesoscopic behavior and you would expect that to no longer see this back and forth. Right? Um. Do we have enough data to actually check when this happens? But I think so. Yes, that's a pretty large delta. Um, so uh, the question is, what is causing the strongest subdiffusive motion? And uh, there is a whole list of possible candidates. <coughs> I'm going to quickly list maybe some of the most interesting candidates. Um, so we know that a, a diffusive motion that is normal diffusive motion that is um, occurs in the presence of some kind of binding partners where the diffusive particle um, binds to something and pauses theirs and then binds to the diffusing, binds to another <coughs> partner and pauses there. So this is diffusion is dispersed with binding event. Uh, this is a, a, a possible scenario which is known to, to generate subdiffusive means for displacement and the corresponding mathematical model is continuous time right uh, another possibility is diffusion through hard wall-like obstacles. Um, when the obstacles are present at high concentration, this is so-called obstructed diffusion, uh, the result is a subdiffusive means for displacement. Uh, yet another possibility is diffusion through uh, the uh, maze of obstacles that are not hard but, but springy, so diffusion <coughs> in um, uh, an elastic environment, a viscous environment filled with, with elastic uh, elements. And um, this mechanism is also known to generate subdiffusive means for displacement, and the corresponding mathematical description is model is fractional non-general motion. And this, of course, is not a complete list. It's just some of the interesting possibilities. There are some very boring possibilities, such as uh, localization error. This artifact that is, has been shown to, to, to mimic subdiffusive means for displacement, even though, though the underlying mechanism is normal diffusion. And of course, we or we have to uh, look at those uninteresting possibilities just to make sure that, that we can move them out. And so this is where the properties of the means for displacement and the loss of correlations um, become useful uh, because um, you, uh, they can help you to eliminate some of the candidates from, from this list and to uh, hopefully identify a, a one dominant mechanism. And so we find that the properties of MSD and the loss of correlations uh, that you know, based, based on this live cell imaging data, are consi we're all consistent with uh, the diffusion of viscoelastic environment being the dominant mechanism. Um, a little bit of intuition, what's causing this viscoelastic environment. Um, so first of all, uh, the fact that um, the uh, nuclear environment is filled with springy elements, such as chromatin fibers, proteins, and so on. And so when our genomic segment uh, hits this element, it experiences a pushback. Uh, there is another contribution to the viscoelasticity that is so obvious that it's easy to forget about it, and this is the fact that um, our genomic segments are not isolated particles, right? They're monomers, they're part of a polymer chain. And so whenever they make a step, they stretch and compress the neighbors. And so if you're fam familiar with the Rouse model, you know that even the, uh, the, the, the Rouse model, the um, ideal non-interacting cloud model uh, already generates a subject the scale next one. So now that we've convinced ourselves that the dominant mechanism is, is uh, diffusion in viscoelastic environment, we can start talking about things more quantitatively. Uh, the um, diffusion in viscoelastic environment uh, is known as the fractional Langevin motion, which is described by fractional Langevin equation. Um, so we're looking at Newton's second law, essentially. And on the right-hand side is a net force experienced by, by the genomic segments. Um, the main difference between uh, fractional Langevin equation and normal Langevin equation that describes normal diffusion is um, the structure of the drag term. Uh, here it contains a, an integral uh, with, with, a, with a memory kernel, which is responsible for the, for the viscoelasticity. 
Um, now that we have the underlying equation, we can uh, set up simple simulations, Brownian dynamic type simulations, uh, which can allow us to test predictions. And of course, we have to come up with predictions first. And so let me briefly summarize uh, what we've done. So this is how a simple set simulation setup looks like. Uh, we have two Brownian particles uh, representing B and DJ segments. They are moving according to the fractional logic equations. So these are not particles, they're not moving in a vacuum, right? These are monomers of the chain moving in a crowded viscoelastic environment where the polymer nature and the viscoelasticity are um, accounted for by, by this um, uh, memory kernel. So the, the fact that these are both on the same polymer is embedded in the structure of this kernel? No. Uh, I think the fact that they're both on the same polymer probably doesn't matter because they are about two million base pairs apart. So they probably are not aware of the fact that they belong to the same polymer. But the fact that they are monomers that but are it's part setting of the it's same, yeah. setting a bound on how far apart they can get. Well, from, yeah. No, uh, the, 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 I mean, two MBs is really a huge distance, right? So uh, it probably has very little um, yeah, effect on the actual spatial distance. But I think what maybe what you're asking is that the fact that they are part of a polymer, right? Yes, it's here. It's so it's part of the viscoelasticity that they're feeling? Yeah, maybe you can look at the structure of this kernel. It's actually quite transparent. So uh, we can see that the long time behavior is governed by alpha. In fact, we can see that when alpha is equal to 1, which is not our case, right? So it's normal diffusion. Mm -hmm. Alpha is equal to 1, this it goes away, and we just have the function, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. we go back to the normal function. Um, what, what about the three dimensional aspect of this? This is three dimensional problem. So, you know, you had this flash when they hit each other, but is that when they hit in three dimensions? Yes, they hit each other in 3D. In, in 3D, okay. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. it's a 3D simulation. And by the way, the original data is 3D. Because okay. okay. right. it's, it's confocal. Yes, it's yeah. confocal. But, but R here is distance between them? Yes, R is the yes. distance between them. <coughs> is the no-show important here? Yeah. I'm sorry? Is the no-show effect important? Like the fact that have a no, the, these are over down simulations. Okay, so you don't have that means. Yeah, in the in simulation, we don't have the notion. Uh, and so we put these particles in a confinement of radius r. I will talk more about a confinement, but for the moment we can think of the confinement as, for example, um, this famous path, right? The biological association domain. Uh, I'm hesitant to do that. On this term in front of my traditions because the term was invented by biologists. Um, and so basically, I think of it as a bundle of loops that constrains the motion of, of, um, uh, of the segments. And so uh, we can ask a number of questions. For example, um, how long does it take uh, these two segments to find each other, uh, which is a mean for Spanish time problem, right? We can ask uh, questions such as how is, is this time scale? determined by the size of the confinement in which the genomic segments move. And so uh, these type of simulations allowed us to test our predictions. Um, I will just highlight a couple of predictions. One of them is that uh, the mean for passage time uh, is still within a biological or reasonable range, somewhere between seconds and hours. And this is probably not obvious because subdiffused motion, strongly subdiffused motion is not an obviously efficient uh, transport mechanism, right? Uh, because subdiffusive uh, particles, uh, what they're good at is at exploring the space very carefully, right? But they're not good at going far. Um, and so yet the prediction was, um, from the theory, was that the passage times are quite short. And the second prediction was um, about uh, regarding the scaling of the mean passage time with the size of the confinement. And so uh, we uh, derived this relationship, which is really it's just scaling arguments. Uh, a few seconds to show this: that um, the mean percentage time scales with R as two to the alpha, where alpha is a subdiffusive scaling exponent. And so, when alpha is small, when alpha is 0.5, say, then uh, two to the alpha becomes four. And this means that if the confinement shrinks by only a factor of two, the the time scale for genomic encounters speeds up by an order, more than an order of magnitude, which is alpha. Alpha is an MST exponent. Like, I'm sorry. Alpha is yes. an exponent. It's, it's exponent, exponent from it's the also exponent. Yes. In the same exponent is a column. Absolutely. Exponent. Yes, that's the same alpha. Yes. Although what initial distribution do you use? Right, and so then what we can do in simulations is, is to explore the initial distribution. We tried 
all reasonable choices possible. We found that initial distribution doesn't, uh, it, what it, it has the effect on the distribution of first passage times, but not that much on the mean first passage time. There's no strong effect on mean first passage time. Uh, also, there may be questions about how do you actually determine the encounter, right? How close the segments have to be in order to con consider them and they have encountered each other. And so, uh, interestingly, we found that for this type of motions, there's uh, the, the interactions uh, distance <coughs> at which the segments can be considered interacting, it really has very little effect. And then we uh, found in the literature that this is a more general result, uh, which is a consequence of a strongly subdiffused motion, uh, also known as the compact exploration block. Um, and basically, I, I think this is related to the fact that the uh, if you zoom in and the subdiffused trajectories, you'll see that it's, they are very rough. <coughs> and so the, the precise uh, distance at which you consider some interacting, it's a second order effect it, it, compared to normal diffusion. So uh, do you know how do you consider the force term in your number? Equation. Well, you, you can simulate uh, how, how do we do it in simulations, or is it a more general question? So, for example, for, for spherical confinement, um, right, you, uh, there is essentially no force in the equation. But you can introduce a force to reflect your the properties of the confinement. So uh, these, these were predictions that were successfully tested by the simulations. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is now that we have the two color imaging data, we can actually test them with, with experimental data. And so uh, remember, the first prediction from theory was the uh, remarkably short first encounter time. Um, and uh, now we can look at the distance trajectories as a function of time from those cells that were uh, in which B and the J were initially closing up. Right? And, uh, these are some representative trajectories. When the distance dives below from its threshold value, this is a potential encounter event. And so we find that indeed, and the corresponding time is the first passage time. So we find that indeed the first passage times are within the range mm -hmm. under an hour. <coughs> the second prediction was about the scaling of the first passage times with the size of the confinement. So what we did to test this scaling, we extracted the first passage times from these trajectories right, and plotted them against R where R that we used was the mean spatial distance between the segments. And so um, these are the data. Uh, remember, I showed you that for the intrachromosomal motion, the scale and exponent was on average 0.25, so 2 over alpha is 8. And here's the line with the slope of 8. Uh, so the, uh, the agreement is, is quite reasonable. So I think the main message from this is that uh, despite the fact that the motion, uh, the dominant magnet motion of genomic segments is um, <coughs> sub anomalous sub diffusion, namely uh, sub diffusion, uh, the uh, first encounter times are still biologically reasonable. And the second message is that uh, the key to this fast first passage times are the sub diffusive motion and its high sensitivity to the size of the confinement. Just to make sure I understand, R is a distance at time zero. Right? No, uh, two hours. Generally speaking, R is, is a confinement. This, the radius of the sphere. But the, what we plotted here uh, is a quantity that may serve as a reasonable proxy for R, so which is R, a main... So <coughs> in, in the capital R is the size of the nuclear... Uh, I'm sorry? Is uh, the x-axis the same R as the capital R? This is a mean, it's a mean spatial distance, which hopefully, uh, between the genomic segments, which hopefully is a reasonable proxy for the capital R which is the size of the confinement. And the uh, prediction agreement between the data and suggested theoretical so, scaling uh, so, 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 so small r in the experiment, what, what, what do we measure exactly? Mean spatial distance between the two genomic segments. The spatial distance changes this time, right? So mean. Yeah. Well, you also include the data when they are very close. Right? Mm. Like they are this change. At some point, they, they, come, they counter. So you include the data when they are very close to each other. Mm. Including, well, they, they don't really come in contact with each other, right? There's a cutoff for the interaction distance. But you have an hour long trajectory, so. Can we choose the threshold as well? Yes, uh, uh, the threshold, yes, this was uh, a very important uh, question that we have to think about. The problem is that. Uh, 
a reasonable value for this threshold would be something on the order of 30 nanometers, probably, right? But the problem is the resolution is not good enough for us to see the segments coming so close. And so we use the combination of this 30 nanometer value and what we know about the um, localization error, the resolution, essentially, to come up with what we think is the minimum threshold. So, so far I was referring to, to the confinement as some abstract entity of radius R, right? And so we were hoping to get some more mechanistic insights into the, 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 the origin of this confinement. Uh, so we took what we know about the antigen gene receptor locus, um, again, it spans about 3 million base pairs. Um, the blue lines are V segments, uh, red lines are DJ. Uh, this particular V is the one that was marked with green, and so here is the genomic distance, 1.8 million base pairs. Um, the yellow lines, <coughs> what about it, but basically these are, these are CTCF binding sites, which are the most likely sites for chromatin fiber to form loops. And so we took uh, all this um, information and uh, replaced it with a bit spring polymer and uh, performed molecular dynamics. Um, Simulations and they, they, the goal was to try to uh, identify um, a model of the uh, immunoglobulin high chain locus that is consistent with various experimental data sets. And the problem with MD simulations, uh, it, obviously, it's a very powerful tool, but the problem is that um, there is really no limit on how complex your model can be, right? You can have this small protein and that protein, and there are lots of proteins that have not been discovered yet um, that are important. Um, and the same is true for the parameters, right? But there's very little known about the parameter values for various interactions, so the parameter space is possible. And so what we decided to do is to adopt the, the following approach, very much in the sort of spirit of how physicists would do this. Uh, we decided to try to come up with the minimal model that is capable of reproducing simultaneously multiple independent experimental data sets. And so here's the first experimental data set. Uh, so the data come from the immunoglobulin and heavy chain locus. Uh, they come from so-called FISH experiment. Uh, the FISH experiment reports the uh, mean spatial distance between any two regions on the DNA as a function of their genomic distance. Okay, so it's microns versus base pairs. Um, we can imagine, as so we can easily imagine, for an unstructured polymer, these, the spatial distance will increase monotonically with the genomic distance. Right. What we see from the data is that it's not the case. Mm -hmm. So these are three million base pairs, and we see that the mean spatial distance is essentially independent of the genomic distance, and it exhibits this plateau at the value of was it about 0.6 or so microns. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we went to our molecular like, dynamics simulation setup and simulated a hierarchy of polymer models uh, to see which model will uh, give us this, this effect. And so uh, we just did systematic. We started it with a simple and structural chain, and of course, it's expected. It generated this monotonic increasing means a spatial distance to genomic distance. When we simulate, when we make our chromatin have a chromatin fiber form a loop. Uh, by the way, this is of course not bare DNA. This is chromatin fiber. So we also had to worry about uh, you know the, the, the size of the bead, the number of the beads, and the packing density, and so on. So when our chromatin fiber forms a loop or two loops. This helps to bring spatial distance down. Um, however, in order to reproduce the plateau and the actual value, which was, I think it's like 0. 0.4, right? Um, the, uh, there has to be a bundle of loops. It's a sort of like structure uh, formed by, by the chromatin fiber. And so this suggests that at least on the global scale, the confinement that influences so strongly the motion of, of the elements comes from uh, northern nucleus. Example, right, but from, from a bundle of loops, chromatin loops. And uh, in fact, this makes particular sen sense for systems such as uh, the immunoglobal chemical chain locus responsible for the production of antibodies, because um, in the absence of such loops, uh, the recombination would predominantly occur between the elements that are genomically proximal. Right? And what you achieve by forming a bundle of loops mm -hmm. is that it gives uh, the entire uh, spectrum of V elements that are scattered across all of these vast genomic distances, roughly equal opportunities to interact with, to encounter the recombination center, which is great for the diversity of 
Maybe a Neef question. So the size of the <coughs> nucleus is on the order of a few microns, right? Yes. And and this 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 uh, polymer is millions of base pairs. So in this uh, domain of a few microns in diameter, what would you then get for the mean squared distance between monomers as a function of the genomic distance, right? So the blue line that you the blue curve that corresponds to an unbounded polymer. Yeah, and remember we are not. Uh, so the, the, the confinement does not come from the nucleus. Why it not? comes from something at a much smaller scale. Which it's way too crowded. It's not an isolated chromosome in the nucleus, right? Oh, sure, but the fact that this, 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 this huge polymer sits in a confined region, uh, the, which is the nucleus, um, he cannot not explain this data. Um, um, Right, I mean, you, you compare... Oh, uh, sorry, are you asking about the, the simulation or experiment? So well, in so the simulations, example, of course, we can simulate a polymer chain in a confinement yeah. of the size of the nucleus. Yeah. And we find the scale and exponent very close to 0.5. Yeah. This and is the Rouse model prediction. Yeah. And but, but for this genomic distance, for example, very concretely, right? So what would you then expect? But, okay, what, what's the diameter of the nucleus in these cells? Probably five to ten microns. Yes, on the order of ten microns. So it's a bit bigger than that, too. So you, so, so you think that the, 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 the size of the nucleus so, is so, too so large? So this is about 0. 0.4 microns. Yeah. Right. The size of the nucleus yeah. is on the order of ten microns. Yeah. Okay. So really yeah. much larger than one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so if you do, I think you asked about unstructured polymer in a confinement of the on this on the order of the the size of the order of the nucleus. So you get alpha equal to 0.5. You just recover the Rouse model. So this motion is substantially more subtitulated. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, just a quick question on that. If you account for the other chromosomes, um, I don't know if you're simulating a human cell or some other kind, but in like humans, right, there's 46 individual chromosomes, and they kind of localize to different parts of the nucleus. And so I don't know if that if they can find each other, but if you account for all of them so in the space of the nucleus. They encounter within a given chromosome. Yeah. The genomic segments are within the Well, yeah, I know chromosome. these ones are. And but you're talking mean, about a crowded effect from the other chromosomes. Right, yeah, so because they yeah. would confine one chromosome to be in a smaller space than the entire size of the nucleus, right? So I'm just curious if, like, Sure, but, but so this is a bundle of loops within that chromosome. Yeah, yeah. Okay. M much smaller scale. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. Uh, how does the volume of the DNA compare to the volume of the nucleus? So how filled is the nucleus? That's a very general question, right? And this can be estimated. So we, we know roughly the volume of single uh, Base pair, right? and so multiplying by the size of the genome can be estimated. Uh, one can also ask about questions about the radius of gyration of an unconfined chromosome, and I think we all know the answer, right? That if you let a chromosome escape the confinement of the nucleus, it will adopt a configuration that is, you know, an order of magnitude or more larger than the size of the nucleus. So this is a very confined thing. Yes. Just a really quick question: like, Why is there an active genomic distance? Oh, you're looking at this. I think this is a question, just a matter of how, where is your origin oh, I that is used to calculate the, the distance. So let me move on uh, with this. So what we just saw is that uh, this simple configuration bundle of loops is capable of reproducing the structural properties of the locus, this fish data that is in this plateau, right? Is it also capable of reproducing the dynamic properties? And the dynamic properties are the one that I showed you, this rainbow uh, pattern in the uh, life cell imaging data in the distance trajectories. Uh, so we find that uh, a bundle of chromatin loops uh, fails to reproduce this pattern. Instead, it produces trajectories that intercross, right? They do not demix. And so this suggests that. Uh, there has to be, in addition to the global confinement that comes from chromatin loops, there has to be a confinement at a more local scale. Uh, what might that confinement be? So this uh, insight from simulations um, 
inspired uh, our biology friends to think about um, epigenetic modifications. So the locus is subject to epigenetic modifications. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that the sites on chromatin that, got, that are epigenetically modified, they acquire the propensity uh, to cross-link. And so we go back to our, to our simulations and uh, incorporate a small fraction, 5% or so, uh, of uh, cross-linkable sites with tunable kinetics. So at this stage, we make no, no, no assumptions as about the lifetime of these cross-links. And so we find that we, we are able to recover the, the original flow. And so this suggests that uh, in addition to the global confinement that comes from the loops, there is a local confinement that comes from, from the cross-links that are consequences of uh, the deposition of epigenetic marks. So what are the proteins that are thought to be responsible for these cross-links? Yes, um, so I think there are several candidates that uh, might serve as, as, as cross-links. <clears throat> one of them is non-coding RNA. Another one is something that is called BRG1 that forms uh, dimers and tetramers and sort of bridges, essentially, that connect uh, chromatin, uh, distant chromatin sites. Right. But then there are many other possibilities. So for the kind of on and off rates that you're uh, finding in your simulations, what is the sort of average distance that these crosslinks are, uh, are happening at? I presume well, these I, I are these are happening yet about the time scale of the crosslinks, the on and off rates, right? Right, I'm but you have a simulation like here which is based on some particular on and off. I'm rate. going to tell you in a moment about the on and off rates. Uh -huh. I think the distance is a separate question, and the way we incorporate it in the simulations is just through the interaction with entry with, with some cutoff. Okay, so so it's so not. We do not explicitly simulate a product. So it's, it's it's tempting. It was tempting, but uh, I think there was no reasonable way of doing this because. The problem is not known. I just gave you a couple of examples <clears throat> that people, I think, there's a consensus that they may be playing the role, but it's, it's not known. Exactly right, but but the assumption here is that uh, the crosslinks are actually physically bringing the uh, nuclear cells well, together. They bridge the bridge to sides. They serve as a bridge. I mean, yeah, okay. So uh, I think this may help us uh, address the question about the, the phase of, of matter of the genome. So we know that uh, the, uh, a, a, the solution of polymer chains is known as a sole, and this is a liquid. Uh, in contrast, a network of cross-linked chain is a gel, and technically this is a sole. And so uh, the result, this result suggests that the uh, chromosomal DNA is organized as a gel. And uh, this leads to the question, uh, not related to what uh, Jeremy just asked, um, the question is, so since crosslinks impart solid-like properties to the genome, how solid-like uh, is the chromosomal DNA? In other words, if we imagine a phase diagram, uh, do we find it deep in the gel phase, deep in the solid phase, or do we find a closer boundary between liquid and solid? So to answer that question, we uh, took yet another piece of experimental data, uh, also something I already showed you, the mean square displacement for the intrachromosomal motion with the strongly subdiffused of scaling exponent. And then we went back to the simulations and changed the on and off rate, changed the lifetime of the crosslinks to see what lifetime will result in the best agreement between theory and simulation and experiment. And when changing the lifetime, uh, when we change the lifetime, the mutual displacement gradually changes the slope. Mm -hmm. And so we find, and so when the, the lifetime is essentially zero, we are in the liquid phase, right? The lifetime that is very large, we are, it's a very solid solid, and something in between is, is a relatively weak gel. And so we find that the best agreement between the black curve, the experimental curve, and the simulations is achieved for the lifetime of the cross link that is very short, on the order of 10 seconds. And just for comparison, a typical life, uh, lifetime of the chromatin loop is about half an hour, so tens of minutes. And so uh, short-lived crosslinks uh, suggest that this is a weak gel, uh, and uh, the locus the therefore is always near the sole gel phase boundary. And then, of course, we go and check uh, to make sure that this weak gel model can reproduce, first of all, with the quantitative measurements on the time scale, the mean passage times, um, and 
the, the, again, the circle is the experiment, the dots come from simulation, and the weak gel reproduces both the range of the first passage times and the scaling of the time and space. Uh, it also reproduces quite well the distribution of the first passage times. So here's a picture that emerges, uh, a distinct signature of a solid is its stability, a uh, signature of a fluid is its fluidity and responsiveness, right? And so the, uh, the, the, the interplay between the experiment and the theory and simulations uh, suggests that the uh, unit law with cavity chain locus is poised at the phase boundary. It's uh, in, the, in the sole phase, but close to the boundary with, with the gel. Mm -hmm. So this is not, uh, this is similar to a molded pudding that has just enough gelatin to barely uh, hold its shape. Without the gelatin, it would form a puddle on the plate, right? With too much gelatin, it would be too um, stiff. And so here is just enough gelatin to barely hold its shape. Very, very weak gel. And the advantages of being um, close to the total boundary are um, probably obvious. Um, so what's good about being in a, in a solid phase, in a gel, is that the genomic interactions are stabilized. So imagine this is a gel droplet. These orange things are crosslinks. Um, and so when two segments are within the droplet, then they are very likely to find each other very quickly while they are essentially um, isolated from the rest of the world. On the other hand, uh, since this is a weak gel, it is very easy for these crosslinks to dissolve. And uh, the, this uh, gives the, the entire locus the enough mobility to reassemble itself and perhaps to form another gel droplet. Um, and so this is the um, advantage of being close to the boundary with the liquid. Right. So, in other words, the position close to phase boundary provides the genome you know, with a trade-off between stability on the one hand and responsiveness on the, on the other hand. Let me summarize the key points. So, um, all this uh, analysis was based on the data from live cell um, imaging, and I think they're a great source of uh, insights of, about the mechanism of uh, genomic motion. Uh, we find that the dominant mechanism of genomic motion is diffusion and viscoelastic environment. And um, uh, this uh, type of motion results in very high uh, rates of genomic associations uh, for the elements, the genomic elements that are separated by vast genomic distances. Uh, the <coughs> motion of genomic segments is strongly subdiffusive, and the subdiffusion is very sensitive to spatial confinement. Uh, the uh, Insights from molecular dynamic simulations uh, suggest that the source of the there are two sources of, of the confinement on the global scale, more global, uh, global scale. Uh, the confinement uh, is uh, imposed by chromatin loops, and on a more local scale, the confinement comes from crosslinks. The crosslinks appear to be weak, which suggests that the chromosomal DNA is a weak gel poised near the sole gel base boundary, and this provides it with a uh, a trade-off between uh, stability on the one hand and fluidity and responsiveness on the other hand. And yet most importantly, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues and mm -hmm. students for the pleasure of working on this problem. Uh, the experiment, the two-color image experiment, was done by uh, Nimish Khanna, Holdok, in the lab of my biological laboratory, Case Murray. And all the theory uh, analysis and simulations were done by my former graduate student, uh, Jun Jiang, who is now uh, a Thank you very much. Uh, since we had a few questions during the talk, and in the interest of having enough time for lunch, uh, I hope you can ask all the, all the questions during lunch. And we'll proceed upstairs. We have two hours for lunch, and then we'll resume at 2.30.